Always wanted to be an entrepreneur, but don't have the time? Why not just buy a business? Hello and welcome to another episode of the Beta Kit Podcast. I am Douglas Saltus, Editor-in-Chief of Beta Kit, and my co-host Rob Kennedy is off this week sipping Mai Tais in the sun. Well, actually, he's been very busy working on his new startup. You see, Rob, like me, is pretty old school when it comes to entrepreneurship. We hear the call, jump off the cliff, and then try to build a business on the way down. But that's so 20th century. It's so much easier nowadays to become an entrepreneur through acquisition. You might be familiar with Beta Kit's coverage of companies like Emerge Commerce, Agora, or even something like Tiny Capital. They buy tech or e-commerce businesses, roll them up, or leverage operational efficiencies on the back end to make the whole greater than the sum of its parts. That's not really what we're talking about today. We're not talking about entrepreneurs buying out other entrepreneurs to create some sort of entrepreneurial Voltron. We're talking about buying into entrepreneurship. And apparently, business is booming. That's according to Elizabeth McRae, co-founder and head of partnerships at Village Wealth, who joins us on today's podcast. Now, Village Wealth acts as a bit of a marketplace marketplace, aggregating business opportunities from brokers, marketplaces, and private sellers. They also work to qualify buyers to help expedite the matchmaking process. But let's get back to the booming business part, which is being driven on both sides, supply and demand. McRae notes that it's estimated that 41% of all SMEs in the U.S. are owned by a baby boomer. And in Canada, over 60% of small business owners are over the age of 50. That's a lot of aging entrepreneurs looking for a payday. The demand is being driven by a bunch of things, including YouTubers and a growing collection of high net worth individuals who believe that a business might be a better asset class to acquire than, say, I don't know, flipping a house. How high net worth? Well, that's the crazy thing. McRae tells us on the podcast that perhaps the biggest driver has been the availability of lending capital. You see, in the US, you need as little as 10% down to buy an existing business. And in Canada, that number is 25% to 40%, depending on if you go, say, BDC or someone else. Now, color me biased as a small business owner and entrepreneur, but it is a trip to hear that banks like BDC might be comfortable with 20% down to acquire a business that wouldn't offer a loan to in the first place. Don't get me started on the U.S. lending market. I mean, what could go wrong, right? Let's dig in. All right, Liz, I think where we should probably start first is having you explain what exactly acquisition entrepreneurship is. Because I had certainly never heard that term before uh, we had talked. So acquisition entrepreneurship is the path to becoming an entrepreneur by buying and growing an established small business. So you kind of skip over the startup phase and you just jump into an existing small business where the owner, you know, the owner wants to move on and do something else or they're ready to retire is typically the case. So that's like a la carte entrepreneurship. You can just go to the store, pick up some entrepreneurship, put it in your basket. And if you can afford the cost of entrepreneurship, you are now ultimately an entrepreneur. That's basically what we're talking about here. I wish if it was that simple. Yeah, everybody would know about it. But it tends to be sort of an underground industry. Business owners, when they're selling, they are not publicly promoted. They do not tell people that they're for sale um, the fact that the business is for sale is, is widely confidential, um, and they use typically what's called a business broker or an intermediary or a mergers and acquisitions professionals to help them sell and access a, a, a buyer pool. But things have been changing over the last, let's say, decade um, as far as opportunity through acquisition, acquisition entrepreneurship. So it's it's been a really fun space to be a part of in the last few years. Okay, so we're going to dig into those complexities. But first, maybe I want to start by just unpacking maybe a bit of a divergence that we have with some of the companies that we cover regularly on, on BetaKit. Uh, we cover companies like Emerge or, you know, tiny capital related investments that they've made. And there are just some, I guess, <laughs> companies, venture-backed institutions in our space that go around buying up generally e-commerce properties, whether that be a Shopify store or like 
um, whether it's the case of like shop.ca, olds, e-commerce startups themselves, consolidate them together and kind of run those with some sort of like network effects uh, and streamlining. How How is acquisition entrepreneurship different from what we're seeing? That's like, I would say, pretty common in the tech space generally. Yeah, consolidation in the tech space. And it you can also, um, you might his, listen to terms like bolt-on, roll-up, strategy, um, happens when there's an existing company or platform company, and then that company decides to grow through acquisition, as opposed to traditional sales and marketing strategies, or or what we see a lot in tech now being par- through partnerships. It's it's growth through acquisition, and what's different about it for entrepreneurship through acquisition is that there is no existing company <laughs> okay. to begin with. Yeah. So you know you're going out to buy, you know, a home for the first time. You're a first time home buyer. Very, very much the same. You're going out to buy your first business. You want to skip over the startup phase. A lot of people that we see in this in this space are looking for alternative career paths as well as an investment strategy. So it's an investment vehicle as well as a career path. They're going to get in and operate this business. Typically, this the size of the market is, you know, under five million enterprise value. Typically, tends to be the small business space. And, and small business, depending on who you talk to, is defined a little bit differently. But let's use those those numbers of enterprise value, or, or which ends up being purchase price under five million. And so we float under the private equity space. You know, private equity and strategic buyers will often buy upstream. They'll buy bigger companies, and this is the stuff that hits the news, right? But small business acquisition doesn't hit the radar of the news typically. And, and these aren't so, necessarily even like tech enabled small businesses. This is going to be any mom and pop kind of any mom and pop. And what's happening now is that people are are finding these mom and pops a lot of it through word of mouth. And these mom and pops are ready to retire. They've owned businesses for some of them decades. So you've got, you know, really established companies, really established client bases, databases, reviews, Everything you can imagine that's in an existing business is already podcasts. there. So they've they've got podcasts, they've got Yelp reviews, they've got good reviews and bad reviews. They've they've done it all before, right? They've got all the scars as well, and they're ready to move on. And now these businesses are kind of coming up for sale. And and you know, industry wise, we we call it like the silver tsunami. It's the baby boomer generation that's starting to retire. So now you've got a surplus of supply of small businesses that are trying to exit and transition. And when you buy a business, you can get it financed and the bank will finance that acquisition because there's cash flow. So it's profitable if you look in the right size of the market. Okay, I I'm, want I'm to hold on the bank stuff because this was a little mind blowing to me. Just noting that you're saying that the the acquisition target here is broadly different than the type of companies that we cover on Beta Kit, but it also seems the acquirer is also broadly different as well, being that they're using this to get into entrepreneurship, but also they're using this as potentially an asset class. Like in all venture capital, private equity is is seen as an asset class, but usually an asset class for <laughs> large, large funds of wealth that need to be managed and dispersed, not for individuals who are like, you know what, instead of flipping homes, maybe I'll flip businesses or something like, am I equating that accurately? I I don't want to do a disservice to the intention here, but is this the same type of people that might be looking for rental properties and saying, you know what, I'm going to buy that mom and pop business instead? Yes and no. So a similar mentality, it's still it's still like the risk profile of that that individual, that investor would be similar. A lot of real estate investors tend to be passive investors. They're not going to get their hands dirty. They're not out there doing the landscaping and doing the plumbing and fixing the repairs. In small business acquisition, you know, the investor is very often going to work in that business. So there's a capacity component of, okay, I'm going to leave my 9 to 5 job or whatever else I was doing. And I'm going to get in. I'm going to work this business. But yes, a lot of them will. They'll get into one, thinking, "Okay, I'm going to do one, and then I'll add on to it, and I'll I'll buy some other complementary businesses, or even within the same industry, with the intention of growing it and then selling it." For the most part, that's what a lot of people do. Some of them just want a career path, and they're like, "I'm just I'm tired of my regular job. I want." I want to get into this strategy and I'll hold it for 10 years. They don't they don't want the just the asset. They want all the smoke. They want to run the business. They want to figure that out. And then if they end up liking it and then make kind of a similar decision as a 
uh, Emerge Commerce, that they're going to do it a bunch of times and connect those purchases businesses. Okay, I, I think I can understand that. Yeah. And they can scale it enough to push it into the private equity bracket to make it to make the company attractive to that tier of buyer. And by in in doing that, they increase the multiple that it'll capture. So the return on investment can be can be quite rewarding if done well. And and not all you know acquisition entrepreneurs want to work in the business. Their their goal is to actually work themselves out of the business, and then it becomes more saleable as well. They want to grow it so they can hire management. They may not always be in that driver's seat, but they are typically in the beginning. Okay. So what are they doing to these businesses, these um, greatest generation baby baby boomer era businesses that they're now purchasing, wanting to take over, maybe package up, maybe uh, grow out of? What are they applying to these businesses to make them more valuable? Is this a simply like, these are not digitally transformed businesses Maybe the mom and pop shop needs a Shopify store and that's it. Like what, what's the work that's involved with these businesses? Yeah, they're looking at a number of different components and tech is one of them. You know, at, right, out, right out of the gate, if they can get in and they can identify efficiencies, you know, how is tech being used? How is tech not being used? Can we enhance efficiencies with the use of tech? Can we build it into an e-commerce store? Um, you're right. A lot of these baby boomer businesses haven't digitized their inventory systems, they may be able to improve efficiencies and reduce overhead costs by, you know, consolidating some of the roles that employees are playing by the use of technology. Um, some of them haven't marketed properly and they've built, you know, their their brand off of, you know, traditional sales or their reputation and they really don't do a whole, of mar- whole lot of marketing. So if somebody comes in with that marketing edge and can really take this company to the next level and put it online or improve efficiencies with suppliers, that kind of thing, even just evaluating how the business model has been run. One another thing that we often see is that people will get in and they'll they'll play with the business model and you know what can we convert into SaaS or yes, there's reoccurring revenue, but we're going to turn that into recurring revenue and put in a monthly subscription to some to some extent. And that's um, that's a lot of what is trending right now is this innovation management and how can we look at you know traditional brick brick and mortar mom and pop shop and innovate it and then scale it. Okay, so you had kind of mentioned that this is popping off a bit. I've obviously never heard of this, but I'm bad at doing my job as a tech journalist, I guess. How big is this market right now? And has either COVID or the impending recession Im- impacted how attractive this is? Like more attractive, less attractive? What's what's going on across the market in this space? It's a mixed bag, to be honest, a very mixed bag. So like in mergers and acquisitions and M&A um, in the industry, you know, there's been a lot of buzz of how COVID has impacted business valuations and how deals are getting done and how they're getting structured. Um, which is a whole, that's a whole podcast in itself. As far as how big is the market? So according to Stats Canada, there's over 1.1 million small businesses in Canada right now, which is, you know, that's generalized with companies under 100 employees. You look at the US and they're around the six, six million companies with under 100 employees. So a fair, fairly large, large market, not astronomical, but there's a, a lack of of qualified buyers down here as well at this end of the market. And if you look at what the baby boomer, you know, studies are showing is that 40% of those businesses will look to exit around now. So that was a BDC study that was put out in 2017. So that's already five years old. What, what we don't quite know yet is how COVID has impacted those numbers. There were, you know, that, that population of closures general buzz from what I'm hearing was if businesses were struggling before COVID, um, they were the hardest ones that were hit and and have already kind of gone gone under and gone bankrupt, sadly. And it's the ones that there were a lot of businesses that thrived through COVID. There were ones that did get digitize themselves and get online. Um, there were some surprising industries that are taking off like tutoring. Bikes, there's a bike boom going on, you know, still going on. There's been some really interesting industries that have taken off. And so, you know, we're seeing some interesting deal structures where if a company did do really well, when it comes time to structure the deal, buyers are wondering, is that revenue increase going to continue into the future? Or if it didn't do well, then how was the company performing before COVID? Why did it underperform during COVID? Is there a story there? And then is it still viable post-COVID? 
And so it's almost on a case by case basis. But, you know, 50% of businesses that are looking to go to market are typically going to transition to someone outside of the family. So if you look at business succession, businesses will typically go to a family member, to management, or to market to a third party buyer. Or some of them will convert into employee share ownership plans and employee structures, but there's still always a component of, of a new successor coming in and, and making some, some structure of an acquisition. At this point, our audience is probably aware that you seem very knowledgeable about what's going on in this space, which is why we're having you on the podcast. I think it's probably time to start talking about your relationship to this space and how, why you know so much. Where does Village Wealth fit in to acquisition entrepreneurship? So with the volume of buyers that are coming into the market, we recognize that there was a need in the ecosystem to qualify these buyers and, and really elevate elevate them. Because if you're just getting into this space and you are a qualified buyer, which means you have access to some capital, you don't always have to have a lot of capital. But you, you do struggle to understand how it works. Because businesses don't promote that they're for sale, it, it's hard for a buyer to position themselves really well and understand how it works. If they're not like a professional buyer, they, didn't, they weren't trained in it. Um, acquisitions are being trained in MBA programs, predominantly in the US. It's a much more popular trend in the US. And like many things, we're a little bit behind the eight ball. But if you are entering this market and you're trying to compete with other buyers out there, and there are a lot of buyers out there who are referred to as tire kickers, if you go to the business broker market, you can get access to private confidentials with as little as a signature. It's, it's an underqualified sort of unregulated space. Like even to sell a business, you don't, it's not like real estate where there's one real estate agent on both sides and it's very strictly regulated. It is not very regulated. Sometimes it's provincially governed. And so you've got people selling businesses who have a variety of backgrounds or even sometimes just put up a shingle and say that they do it. So you've got a, a a wide variety of people who are selling businesses. And then you've got a wide variety of people saying, I am a buyer, I am buying a business. But besides that, you don't know much about them. So Village Wealth is there to kind of separate the doers from the talkers. And we help buyers articulate what their search criteria is, give them a presence, give them you know, some more credibility through qualification. We qualify them for their financial capacity. We verify their proof of funds for down payment. And then we provide access to the ecosystem. So we are constantly networking and, and partnering with sellers in the ecosystem to try and bring these parties together. And we're trying to almost bring this quiet underground market above ground to an extent while still maintaining maintaining like confidentiality of of both parties. Okay. There's a lot there that I want to dig into. First, what does a qualified buyer look like? Like obviously you're saying that there are people with MBAs who are seeing this as a great asset class to roll up and make a profit from. And then there are probably people who are like, I watched the Steve Jobs movie and I would like me some of that. Let's go buy a business. What are the major conditions other than like do they actually have the money to do this or are they a criminal? <laughs> like what are, what are, how, how are you qualifying these buyers? Yeah. So building their profile is one of the first kind of stepping stones. Like you can come on Village Wealth and build a pre free profile and, and people are coming to it to a degree and some are filling it out and some are, aren't filling it out. And it's kind of our first, it's our first insight into whether they are a serious buyer or not, because if they, if they understand the process and they understand how to articulate what they're looking for, they will complete our profiles. And they're not very difficult, but a lot of people who don't understand the process or the lingo or the language will stumble with some of our inputs. And so that is one of our qualification pieces. Um, we are trying to evolve our profiles so that they are capturing more concrete pieces of information from buyers. Um, one of the biggest things that we hear from the seller side of it is, you know, you can have an MBA and you can have a ton of education and you can have all the capital you might need for an acquisition. But if you don't have the, the guts and the drive and the mindset, like a growth mindset, you're not going to ever pull the trigger. So we hear, you know, in deal language and from M&A, like, you know, no deal is perfect. 
And so some people who enter the market and they're like, I'm going to buy a business and I'm looking for, you know, a business that does X amount of revenue and there's management in place. And like, no, you're looking for perfect. And in the small business space, it rarely exists. There's hair on every deal. And you need to be able to see past these operational inefficiencies. You need to look at where you as a buyer and look at your skill set and your capabilities and what you bring to the table and look at what you can fix and how you are going to bring bring value and and be able to grow this company. And it's it's a very personal connection uh, between a buyer and a and a and a business and then the the owner. Like like it's funny, you know, you buy a house and you will almost never never meet the person who sells it. Buy a business, you're right in the sheets with them. In a very it's like you're ways, yeah. getting married and writing your prenup and, and your divorce agreement yeah. on the day you get married. You're like, hey, we're going to live together for a little while and then um, and I'm going to kick gonna you out. out. <laughs> I'm going to keep all your gonna, stuff. Yeah. And I'm going to keep all your stuff and you can, and I'll pay you for it and see you later. But there's so much knowledge in that transfer of ownership that is fragile and it is risky. And the business acquisition is not for everyone. So, so how are you, how are you vetting? A, that they have the stones to make a purchase. How are you vetting that they're not going to be jerks throughout the acquisition process? And how are you vetting that they're, if they're not making an acquisition, they're not going to reveal confidential information to friends to do shady deal stuff that happens so often in my space that I write about it every day? Well, obviously we can't protect against everything. It's always buyer beware. And same goes for sellers. It's sellers beware. So we have to be careful on our end from a liability and a disclaimer position. Like, you know, if we put buyers in front of sellers, like, oh, we're not, we're to an extent, we're not, well, we're not responsible. We're just not responsible. But we want to elevate the ones that are really motivated to do something. And so what we find is that people will look on their own for, you know, a period of time and then they get frustrated and then they hear about us and they're like, oh my God, can you guys help me? Because I'm, this is exhausting. This is painful. I mean, as a buyer looking for a business, you have to go and first of all, you have to Google everyone who sells businesses. And then you have to try and book meetings with them. And you have to try and book coffee and get them to meet with you where half of them aren't answering your phone calls because they don't know who you are. And then you're talking to your lawyer and your accountant. And you're going, hey, want to buy a business? And um, do you know any that are for sale? And they're like, uh, okay, I'll keep it in mind. Let me, I'll let you know if I hear of anything. You know, and like if those people who are selling businesses, if they don't have a good SEO presence or a good marketing presence, buyers never going to find them. So it's very much like, let me get my, let me get my business card Rolodex, like photo album of business cards out and and look for someone that I know. Um, And you're trying to stay top of mind with people who sell businesses or people who have access to business owners. It can take like the Harvard Business Review to guide for buying a small business is a great resource. And they and it's almost getting a little bit outdated. It's still very much referred to. But as technology is changing and the search method methods are changing, there are newer, newer resources to pull from. But it says that typically a buyer will look for 18 to 24 months. So the time frame to find a business is long and painful. So people will get frustrated and then they'll come to us and then they'll jump through all of our hoops. And and a, a big telltale piece is like the conversations that we have with them. Like our, our buyers are like, they're not assholes. Like our buyer, if you're going down this path, like this is, this is a very conscious decision. You just don't, didn't happen into this because okay. you're devoting a lot of your time. So you're, it. you're more accrediting the interest than anything else. That's fair. Let's talk yeah. about the other side of the, the two-sided marketplace. How much is this that you need to help surface up companies to buy and how much of this is there are companies to buy everywhere and you're surfacing up buyers how are you how are you satisfying the other side of the marketplace are you connected with potential companies themselves that are putting themselves in your marketplace do you have relationships like are there binders full of companies ready for sale through other intermediary groups is there is there a village wealth for the acquired companies that is me- meeting up with you and, and and kind of trying to connect the dots here? Where, where does that, uh, I guess, deal flow come through? Yeah, great question. And it's coming from a variety of places. So we partner with business brokers and M&A firms, so we get their deal flow from them. So there are a handful of business for sale listing sites, which is one of the reasons we created Village Wealth was we just found that there was like, that was a very competitive market and there's more marketplaces getting listed all the time because there's a ton of people that are going, 
oh, no one can find businesses for sale. Let's start a business for sale marketplace. And I'm like, hey, have you looked at your competition or do you know who else is out there? Because there's a lot of them and they're more coming all the time. And so we, we pull their data into ours and we aggregate so our buyers can access kind of like Trivago where they can come to us and then we actually push our quality, we do our qualification piece and then we push our buyers to those sites. So it's of, of benefit to the other sites as well. And then we have, there's almost like a, a staging process of, for the businesses. So, you know, we don't just list any business for sale. We want to make sure that they're prepared and they have what buyers are going to ask for. So there's a great deal of due diligence that goes into selling a business. Those sellers need to be prepared. So we do have partners that help them get prepared and, and do take them to market. And then, and then we would take that listing from there. And then there's a, a pocket of business sellers that would never, ever post a business on the other listing sites because of the unqualified nature of buyers that come from those sites. It's like you're, it's like listing on Kijiji and you know, you never know who you're going to get every box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. And so we're attracting, you know, larger accounting firms that have advisory divisions that typically wouldn't list on those sites, but they're looking at us and looking at us as a trusted partner for deal flow. So to answer your question in a nutshell, a variety of places. Do you want to work where your imagination makes an impact? Join Tech at RBC, a fast-paced team of innovators working to create positive change for their clients and communities. At RBC, you'll build a meaningful career while working on high-impact projects with some of the top tech and business experts in the country. RBC is hiring for a range of tech positions, from developers to data scientists to cybersecurity professionals and more. So if you want to make an impact, check out the latest roles at jobs.rbc.com slash tech. How does Village Wealth make its money? Where do, where do you step into this little virtuous cycle of supplying buyers with sellers and, and how do you wet your beak? We monetize through buyer verification with our broker partners. So brokers get inundated with inquiries from buyers and we are providing our software um, that verifies for proof of funds. So we verify for proof of funds with down payment uh, for cash line of credits and investments. And so our technology will allow a buyer to kind of self self log into their banking system and it, our system will verify those accounts. So that is one way that the industry is using us right now. And so there's an annual membership for that. Buyer subscriptions are something we are going to be implementing very soon. So right now it is still free if you're a buyer, but there are features and benefits that we're building into that subscription, those subscription for buyers to have a profile with us and get it, get advantage of all of the offerings that we're building in. And that will grow over time as well. And then we do revenue share with our advisors. So we get inquiries from buyers and sellers about service providers. And so we have some microservices on the sites where we do a revenue share with specific advisors or depending on what they're providing, we might do a revenue share across the board of everything that they're offering. So like, hey, um, here's your referred lawyer and they'll do the deal terms for you or things like that. Yeah, that kind of thing. So depending on the profession, sometimes we can't do a revenue share with some professions, but you know, for like someone in exit planning who it's going to be a monthly retainer for them to help prepare the company get for sale, then it would be a, re a monthly revenue share with that profession. So it depends. We have like, you know, in a business transition, there's probably seven or eight professionals that are involved through the transaction because both parties need so much help. So there's accountants on both sides, there's lawyers on both sides, there's exit planners, there's a broker or an intermediary transaction advisor. So if a business owner comes to us, we do, you know, we assess what their needs are. And we would, if we make a referral to a partner, then, you know, we would take a, a revenue share or an affiliate fee on it. How many of those services are you going to start offering in-house in the near future so that you can take a greater margin of all deals? That's a good question. At this time, we don't we don't foresee bringing any of that stuff in because it changes our business model and we are not service providers. We are a digital connection platform that connects those parties 
place, you know, and when we jump across the border, so right now we're just in Canada, but when we move into the States, it's a very different ball game down there because they have better access to capital than we do in Canada. So we're segueing into the financing topic here. Are you, are you ready for this? I'm super ready to, <laughs> to segue into the finances. It's, it's where I'm going next. The, the two major questions I wanted to ask here, because I think at this point, our listeners have probably a sense of your business. And while you were talking, I was actually even thinking like, you're very similar to Borowell in, in a certain sense, like in, as, a, as a fintech where you're like, you're very happy to provide someone a free credit check so that they can validate that they are worthy of certain cards. And then you're very happy to provide them a bunch of um, product placements of referrals for certain types of cards or loans or, or products that you might take a cut on. What I'm, I'm interested in, in the, the third component of this, you were talking about how much interest there is on the buyer side, how much interest there is on the seller side, but there's a third component, which is just the amount of money that's flowing into the ecosystem forcing the need for more transactions to happen. And when we cover this from a beta kit perspective, we we cover it from uh, traditional venture private equity. It's like, oh my God, deal sizes have never been higher in Canadian tech. Why is that? Mm-hmm. It's because there's a huge amount of foreign direct investment. All the US money that is um, found level cannot find another US company to invest in is now spilling over into Canada. Oh, now all of a sudden we have a bunch of Canadian unicorns. Now all of that is also being punched right in the junk right now um, as there's some there's some clawback. But like the explosion wasn't caused by capital activity in Canada. It was caused by capital in the U.S. that needed to go somewhere and it found Canadian companies. So I want to talk about the capital component because you were there are things that you told me about how these deals are being financed that blew my mind because these aren't necessarily solely want to be entrepreneurs who have the financing, but we should probably also talk about the differences on either side of the border here, because you could say that we're behind relative to the United States, or maybe you could say that we're not as crazy as Americans are when it comes to turning every possible thing into an asset class or like a bridge loan. So which one do you want to start with first? Because you're the expert. Well, yeah, the in the US, their risk appetite is certainly different than ours. We have a different palette, if if you would say. So there's a couple different things that's happening in, in acquisition financing. One of those things is uh, when you talk about, you know, the excess capital that's floating around and trying to find a home, one of those homes is being found in acquisition entrepreneurship. And and in, in the term, and you can research this term and, and look it up and it's called a search fund. So some of that kind of loose capital, if it's if it's less institutional capital, is finding its ways. We've there's a lot of just investors that are backing acquisition entrepreneurs. So you've got somebody who's going out there saying, I'm gonna go look for a business, I'm gonna get in there and I'm gonna operate it, but I don't have all the capital I need. So they're pooling investors around them, and it could be family and friends. It could be high net worth individuals and angel investors. It could be private equity that they are finding you know, excess capital, and they're saying, I'll go find a business. You help me with the down payment, and I'll be able to make this acquisition. And then that's a lot of those entrepreneurs will, will make multiple acquisitions because they've got backing. And they can afford to buy a little bit bigger of a business. So the, it's called a search fund. Um, there's a lot of buzz in the U.S. around search funds. The other component is institutional lending from banks. And so in the U.S., there is almost like an insurance body. It's called SBA. And um, SBA is a federally backed program. And essentially what they're doing is they're insuring the banks on their loans. So you can buy a business in the U.S. with as little as 10% down. And so if you find, very cool, if you find an investor who will put in that 10% 10 for you, you're able to buy a business with almost no money. If you're going to get in there and operate it and you can, you know, convince the investor that you are a capable, motivated person to, who's going to actually pull this off, then yeah, you can, you can raise some capital and go out and buy businesses with very little of your own money. And one of the trends that's happening is there's a ton of YouTubers that are coming out about it because this, this movement has been growing over the last, you know, 20 years. 
the strategies is being taught at Stanford and other MBA program level programs. There's been books being published over the last five years. And then in the last two years, predominantly, there's been YouTubers and influencers that have come out and they're interviewing people on a weekly basis about how they are doing acquisitions. And now there's enough trend and history and stories that they could report on them. So that's why there's so much buzz around it. In the U.S., a lot more lending agencies, like there's like 5,000 banks in the U.S. So much more competitive, much higher appetite for risk. Then you cross the border and you come into Canada and our lenders, they're coming along and there's some better programs that are coming out. Like the National Bank will finance 60%. BDC might do up to 70, 75% if the conditions are right. So looking at it the other way, you know, if you're a buyer in Canada and you're using only your own money, you would need, you know, at minimum 25% down, 25 to 40% down in Canada. So more of a need in Canada to find other investors to go in on it with you um, in most cases. But I mean, if you're a mid-career professional and, you know, you crunched, you know, you worked 15, 20 years in your corporate job and, you know, you made some good investments and maybe you turned around real estate and you're going, oh my gosh, I just want to do something else. You know, that's where we find a lot of our buyers and they're going, wow, we, I can innovate. So they're, they're entrepreneur glamping. Yeah. <laughs> and they're like, I don't have a, I don't have like my golden ticket startup idea. I am not going to do a startup or I've got three kids to feed and a mortgage. I can't go back to, I can't go to not making an income. But when you buy a business, there's a salary there. And the cash flow, the profit in the business is paying the debt servicing on the loan and the banks will finance it. So it's more possible than people might think. They just don't know about it. Let's let's talk about that because this is what blew my mind because Americans only need 10% down to do something that YouTubers told them to do. I completely buy in 2022. That's just a, a settled state of affairs. That's a going concern. When you told me that BDC will finance let's see, look at this in reverse, up to 75% of the acquisition cost of a small business. That blew my mind because as a small business owner, I don't think <laughs> that BDC would give me a loan for up to 75% of the valuation of my business. So where is the disconnect there between, particularly in the last two years where we've seen the federal government have to come in, set up emergency loans that were administered by the banks which they didn't want to do, requiring it be guaranteed to the government to provide just a life raft to businesses that were struggling in COVID. But somehow BDC will give that mid-career business operator from Deloitte up to 75% of the thing that they want to buy to then eat into the margins of the mom and pop business. How does that reconcile? What division of BDC is doing this? And are they talking to the rest of BDC or anyone else in Canada? Uh, they are talking about it. They're talking a lot. From what I see, they talk a lot more about, you know, the trend that's coming and succession planning and that. I mean, and they are getting the word out. But I still talk to a ton of people that are like, what is BDC? I've never heard of that before. They don't do, you know, bank accounts. They don't do line of credits. They're not... Um, a typical go to your branch bank that you'd go to on Main Street. And I, I should say they they do obviously provide like business lending services. It's a huge component of it. Beta Kit doesn't often cover that. We're we're usually talking more about adventure. We've been talking a lot our recent episode on VCCI, which is um, fund of fund support, which is admitted, administered by BDC on behalf of the federal government. I get all of that. I'm just wondering why BDC specifically is more interested in giving people money to buy a business with historicals, uh, and let's add it to any other bank. Because it's then risk, they, it's less risky. Than, than giving the business money itself to expand and grow? Well, it's like any loan application. So if you're going to grow, like there are certain conditions that the business has to meet so in, in order for it to write a loan application and access capital. And I am not a finance expert, just for the record. Same, I disclosures. I have a finance listeners. background. So you're not hearing this from the horse's mouth, okay? So like they're looking at it from a lip risk profile too. And it's their money at the end of the day. So they're looking to protect it. So 
when any business goes and applies for a growth loan, they have to meet certain criteria. And it's no different in acquisition. That, that business needs to be a bankable company. It absolutely does. It needs to have strong cash flow. The debt servicing ratio has to be there. It's got to have the right history. It's got to have the right growth potential. They still ask for a business plan. They still ask for projections. But they're looking at the company in relation to who's buying it. And they look deeply at, you know, what is the risk profile of the buyer? And what is the risk profile of the company? And they're looking at that in, those two pieces in tandem. So, you know, they, they recognize that, you know, there is a great population of our small business community that is going to look to exit and retire. And if they don't do something about it, then there's going to be a lot of um, industry ripples, you know, and, and in nature, you know, when, when one business closes or one industry suffers, you know, something else will come in and fill its place. And technology has shown us again and again that, you know, there is, there's solutions that will come out of the woodwork, but um, the vast number of businesses that are looking to tra transition out, um, of business owners, um, was something they, they couldn't avoid. So yeah, kind of this innovation path, this path for opportunity for acquisition is now open, but still like people just don't know about it. And these businesses have been around for like some of them decades and they, they have, they are profitable and they have the cash flow that can support the debt servicing. It's, it's a risk. Like there's a great book called buy then build and it, it demonstrates that a business acquisition is 98% chance of success versus what is it for startups? Like 10, 10% if you're lucky. success rate. If the wind's right. I, 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 um, I understand that framing. I just, uh, and this might be completely unfair and I will disclose it. And my listeners who have stuck around with this podcast long enough would also understand this is just wh where I am. When I hear you describe this, as a small business owner and entrepreneur myself, I hear that our financial institutions are more comfortable giving money to high net worth individuals to acquire businesses that they wouldn't necessarily feel comfortable giving the loans to directly or supporting their initial growth. And that is an, an interesting framework to this separate to all the other reasons why this might be accessible, interesting, strategically opportune, all of that stuff. But you you did say an interesting uh, word. You said the risk word. And I want to I want to ask more questions about the risk on this just in terms of this process, but then also for you participating in this market because you've noted headwinds uh, helping you with this, but then the potential of like what happens when this segment of baby boomer generated businesses all sell through. And as we've seen historically, net new small business generation has like slowed, slowed to a crawl. Is this a, if not a bubble, a blip in an asset class because it's not sustainable? Are you tracking that? Or is are we in the kind of like gold rush era of mom and pop asset class right now? That's a great question. I have my opinion on it. I haven't seen much data on it. Like, I, I think it is a little bit of a bubble, but I think if you think, you know, generational trends, and this is my own opinion, I'm considered a millennial. I'm going to date myself here. Hanging on to millennial by like, yes, basically. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, like early yeah. 80s baby, Omni elder millennial. Yeah, right there with you. Yeah. I'm an 80s baby. I'm on my third business. My dad was an entrepreneur and he had a business for 30 years, right? Like the trends are changing. You know, that generation held businesses longer and it was it was their job. And a lot of them don't relate to them being entrepreneurs. They will talk about themselves as like, oh, I'm a small business owner. Um, or they'll say like their profession title instead of I'm an entrepreneur. You know, so they see themselves differently and they hold businesses longer. I predict that in future generations, we won't hold that asset for as long. And we're seeing it now too. I mean, you look at business for sale marketplaces like MicroAcquire, those are startups that are turning over at a, a very quick rate. You know, businesses that are not even five years old are selling and turning over. So people who are starting micro businesses are selling them to make a profit and turn those over. So I think I, that's what I see happening is, yes, we are in a bit of a bubble, but I think it's 
generational trends and the younger generations kind of attention span to something like I just don't think they're they're not going to hold businesses as long. So the inventory of supply of businesses will turn over much quicker than it has um, generations past. At what point do you see yourself finding buyers for really, really strong PowerPoint presentations for businesses that don't exist yet? Like two years, four years? How, you mean how long? investors on pitch decks? Yeah. Oh gosh, we. It's all intellectual property, it. right? You've yeah. been asked about it. Sorry, I was joking. Over, you've been asked about that. We've like as far as um, like people who are looking for growth capital, if they can access our buyers as investors, is that what you mean? If, if they can, well, I, I was being facetious and saying, at what point do people just start submitting PowerPoint decks and then getting acquisition offers for those? Oh yeah, well, it's kind of yeah. Oh yeah, it's it's kind of happening in micro acquire and like there's other platforms where people are submitting pitch decks with ideas and, and they're finding investors like those, those platforms exist. It's not our platform. Oh, it's just traditional VC. <laughs> of course. Oh, yeah. <laughs> How could I forget? It's all out there somewhere. Matter of finding it. The Beatty Kid podcast is produced by Beatty Kid Incorporated. It's edited by Katie Lore, and its hosts are Rob Kennedy and me, Douglas Saltis. To learn more about how you can support this podcast, head to patreon.com slash betakit.